and welcome to another episode of The Dark Place. Welcome everyone. And tonight we, we will be broadcasting on the other people's show, Facebook, and YouTube. So please go support one of those three. Very much appreciated. Before we get into tonight's show, like I said, please go to all of our social media pages. Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, TikTok, and Instagram. Welcome everyone to another episode of The Dark Place. The show and the podcast that dives into compelling stories of tragic individuals who have left an incredible mark on history and society for better or for worse. I'm your host, Adam, and tonight we're going to dive into the tragic, tragic story of Chandra Shearer. Now, I want to give a little bit of an overview of Chandra. And her story is a story that continues to grip the hearts of those who, who hear it for the first time. It's a story of a young life taken way too soon. It's a harrowing tale of cruelty and violence among ch- teenagers. And it shocked the nation. Now, although I do not remember this case when it first happened, I do remember hearing and listening to it a couple years back on the Morbid podcast. And it always stuck with me because of the sheer (sighs) torturous ways that these teenagers treated this young girl. These were all demented teenagers, all from a broken home, all going down a path of evil, devastation, and destruction. So in this episode, I'm going to take you on a tale through her life, the events leading up to her tragic death, and the shocking details in the aftermath. That still resonates today. So Chandra was born in um, on June 6th, 1979 in Pineville, Kentucky. Her parents were Stephen and Jacqueline. They divorced and Jacqueline remained and removed and uh, moved, excuse me, to Louisville, Kentucky. After another divorce, she moved her family to New Albany, Indiana, right across the way from Louisville. And then Stephen resettled in Jeffersonville, Indiana, with his new wife, Sharon. Shanda would stay with him on the weekends. This would be key into this tragic story. Now, upon moving, Jacqueline enrolled Shanda in Our Lady of Perpetual Hope High School. Or... Not a high school, but a uh, more of a, uh, a Christian school or a uh, private school. But Shanda wanted to go to a public school, so her mother agreed. And she transferred Shanda to Hazelwood Middle School, where she joined the basketball team. She had always been involved in sports, and she really did excel. She was great at basketball, and then she enjoyed writing poetry. And was rather good at it. Now, when Shanda was enrolled enrolled in the Hazelwood Middle School, she met Amanda. When they met, they got into a physical altercation, ended up fighting, and they both received a week of detention. In detention, the teenagers connected on a bond of just talking with one another, I guess putting aside their differences Amanda was a little bit older than Shanda, so maybe Shanda looked up to uh, Amanda a little bit. 
and they became they became friends and after that they became inseparable enter melinda melinda was born on october 28 1975 in new albany indiana and she had two older sisters they all lived with their parents and uh Majory and Larry Loveless and uh, Majory would disclose intimate aspects of her sexual relationship to her daughters, saying he enjoyed watching her have sexual intercourse with other men, and he that made her jealous and something she she didn't like. She did not like it, or she did not willfully engage in these sexual acts, and then the daughters were subjected to hearing about this as well. There were also pictures around the house that the daughters happened to see. And uh, Larry subjected that family to a rather um, inappropriate and downright uh, criminal um, aspect of a relationship. They also endured uh, physical abuse. And they, they recalled, Melinda recalled a time when her father became extremely religious he claimed that the demons had possessed them and all this was in the dolls that she had. All this was in like some of the toys and the demons were cast out and uh, cast out of the kids as well. Um, and then the religious phase lasted about three years from the research that I've been able to find. Now, I want to get a little bit up leading to the murder. There are four women, girls, I guess you could say, teenagers, that were involved in this. Some of the girls did not even really know each other until this particular night. We've got Hope, Tony, Amanda, Shanda, the victim, and Laurie Tackett. So I'm not going to go into each and every individual and their backstory, but each one of their backstories is very similar to the one that I just told. It involved uh, pain. It involved seeing, seeing things that a teenager or young child should not be subjected to. Am I saying that it um, it's justification for the actions? No. But you can see the background that these four girls had in common. And Shanda, who was excelling in school, was younger than these girls, but also kind of looked up to them and had a, uh, I guess, a fascination with the girls because they were turning her on to things that she wasn't used to. And it seemed to be that Amanda ended up being jealous because she thought that Shanda was trying to take her girlfriend away. So let's get a little bit into the leading up to the murder. So before Shanda arrived at Hazelwood Middle School, Amanda and Loveless would never be seen apart. Amanda and Shanda, inseparable. Once Shanda and Amanda became friends... Uh, Loveless, which is uh, Amanda's friend, realized she was losing the close bond she shared with Amanda. Loveless grew immensely jealous of their newfound friendship. And Loveless told Amanda to stop hanging out with Shanda. When she saw that didn't stop, she threatened Shanda in the hallway. Now, Amanda was 15 years old at this time. Shanda, three years younger. And Shanda's mother didn't really approve of the of the friendship between the two because of the age difference. But she didn't want her daughter to be lonely, so she kind of allowed um, you know, the friendship to occur. Now, once her mother found out that that her daughter had forged her signature and Amanda was the one who in, instructed her how to do so, her mother said Shanda could no longer hang out with Amanda anymore cease she transferred uh shanda back to the independent school our lady peace perpetual hope is where she was transferred back to her mother saw that 
Amanda and this group of girls, well, not the group of girls because they, they didn't really hang out, but Amanda and uh, Loveless, they, they were a bad influence. She didn't want her daughter to be tangled up in this. Now, like I said, Amanda was 15 years old at the time, three years older than Shanda. Shortly after she switched, school, switched schools, Jacqueline had, Jacqueline had found a letter. She had told the newspapers the letter made her believe that Amanda was obsessed with Shanda and wanted a sexual relationship with her. Jacqueline had a talk with Shanda, which ended on a good note. So, later on, she tells the newspapers, I did find this letter, and it made me believe that Amanda was totally obsessed with Shanda and was trying to talk her into this sexual relationship. So that's kind of the scene that is painted with these girls and and, um, what's going on. Now, these were the letters that, you know, were were not found until after the murder. And they they were in the box that said, For your eyes only, please do not touch. Inside the box contained letters that Amanda had written to Shanda. And according to her mother, who spoke to the um, Courier Courier Journal in 93, the letters said things such as, I like boys. Do you? I like girls too. Do you? I think it's okay to touch. Do you think it's okay to touch? Have you ever touched another girl? These letters weren't really found, like I said, until after the murder. So, you've got a jealous girl, a girl that's obsessed with a younger girl, and Shanda has been threatened multiple times, over and over again. So, hours before the murder, Loveless put her plan into action. She called Amanda and told her that she was going to kill Shanda. A classmate who was not named in the news article overheard part of Amanda's side of the conversation. And the classmate stated he heard Amanda tell Loveless not to kill Shanda. She would get arrested just to scare her. Neither Amanda nor the classmate told Shanda or the police about the conversation. So there had been kind of on a couple of occasions word had got out that Loveless did want to kill Shanda. She was jealous and thought that Shanda was taking Amanda away from her and she couldn't have it. And jealousy is is a bad thing. Um, Believe you me, it can ruin many things. But never let it get to the case or to the the point that that it does in this case. So... The girls had planned to go to a Sunspring to a Sunspring concert. It would stop and scare Shanda along the way. The three teenagers had not met Shanda, but before but they knew about uh, what was going on with Loveless and Amanda in that whole scenario. So the four girls had been in Loveless's house, getting ready for the concert and lis- listening to Loveless go on and on and on about how much she hated Shanda. So you get the scene that the girls are going to a concert. Two of the girls, or three of the girls, have never even met Shanda. But they hear Loveless going on and on. I hate this girl. We're going to stop. We're going to scare her. She's going to leave my girlfriend alone. I'm not going to have her taken away. So, like we said, Shanda earlier, she stayed with her father's on the, father on the weekend. And she was there for the weekend. She she had earlier been out with a friend at a party, and uh, she wanted her uh, friend Michelle to spend the night, but Michelle didn't stay because her father said no. So uh, pretty much what happened is that Shanda wanted her friend to come over and spend the night. Her friend's dad said no, she's not going to stay. So the four teenagers had told Shanda, you know, after your dad goes to sleep, sneak out, hang out with us. So they said they were going to um, go to this. Um, I can't, it, it, it eludes me at the moment, but they said they're going to go to the witch's castle or something like that and, and check it out. 
So the four teenagers, they leave Loveless's place. They're heading for Shanda's place. And they are, they're heading their way. So Shanda opens the door to her house, sneaks out, and gets in the car, and they drive off. Now, Shanda's like, who are these girls? You know, they say, uh, Amanda's like, these are friends. And we're going to go to uh, the witch's castle is uh, what the name of the place is called, the witch's castle. Shanda said she would be able to go around midnight, and that's what time that this originally took place. So they left and headed to the concert and planned to return to Shandon's Shanda later. The concert was being held at a skate park, and the girls met some boys upon arriving there. So later in the night, they do they go back, they get Shanda, everything goes according to their plan, they go to the witch's castle, and once that happens, um, that's when things get very, very scary. Loveless got really upset, pulled out, pulled out the knife, and put it at Shanda's head, the back of her head and interrogated her furthermore about the relationship that she had with Amanda. So Shanda thinks she's going to this uh, after-concert party with these friends. Well, with Amanda and Amanda's friends. So upon driving down the road, she pulls out this blade, the sharp kitchen knife, and puts it on the back of Shanda's head and starts saying, Tell me more about this relationship. Tell me more about what's going on. I want to know because I do not believe you. Tell me or I'm going to kill you. So Shanda starts crying and uh, while she's being yelled at. I mean, on and on and on. And she's like, we've not done anything. We've not done anything. So they, they, she kind of tortures her on the way to Witch's Castle. They take Shanda out of the car. They make her take off her watch in her jewelry, and all of her property, they tie her wrists and ankles together, and they mock and they make fun of her. They threaten her. They push her down. They rip her clothes. They strip her down. They're kicking. They're, they're, they're prodding with a knife at her. And Shanda's crying. Why are you doing this? Why? I haven't done anything. Crying. Hurt. Alone, fearing that they would be seen, the girls pick up Shanda and they force her into the back of the trunk. They push her head down. Now, according to the court documents, once the teenagers arrived at the woods near Tackett's house, they forced Shanda out of the car once again. I was wrong. This was when they forced Shanda to take her pants off. Loveless punched her, kneed her in the face multiple times. That's when they used rope to choke Shanda. According to Loveless, Shanda was kicking and screaming for help. But she just stood there and watched as Shanda pleaded for her life. Loveless was told, shut up, shut up! After Shanda lost consciousness, she was placed back in the trunk of the car. So after this happened, so what happened, you know, in the earlier scenario, now they're afraid we're going to be caught. Let's, let's put her back into the trunk, go further away, a more abandoned area, take her out, strip her down, knee her, punch her, prod her. So they went back to Tackett's house and they went inside for a bit because they thought Shanda was passed out. When they were in there, inside the house, getting something to snack on, washing up, they started hearing noises from the trunk. Tackett went outside and then they heard Shanda once again. So they all got back into the vehicle. And they drove around for a few hours with Shanda in the trunk. Then they pull over 
because Shanda is a fighter. She won't give up. She's still clinging to life. So they pull over and then they get a tire iron. Open the trunk and start beating Shanda with the tire iron. So after they did that, they decided, what are we going to do? How are we going to get rid of this body? So they decided to set fire to Shanda's body. But Shanda, before that, was still fighting for her life. So when they decided, okay, let's go ahead and set fire to her, they go to the gas station, they get a two liter of soda, drink it, or pour it out, I assume, fill it up with gasoline, and then drive a little further down the road to a rural area. They get out, beat Shanda. Each time she made a noise, a wince, beat her with a tire iron. Then they drove a little further, decided to get her out. She's still breathing, gasping for air. They pour the gasoline on top of her. They pour the gasoline on top of Shanda, a 12-year-old girl who's really done nothing wrong. After being beaten, stabbed, kicked, hit, roped, choked, humiliated, and now burned. She did die within just a few seconds. Around 10.45 a.m. on January 11th, 1992, two hunters were driving through the part of Madison, Indianapolis, when they came upon a grisly sight. The burned body of a young female that they originally mistook for a mannequin. They called the police, the police responded, and they started an investigation immediately. They found footprints, tire tracks, and a melted soda bottle. So, the arrest, trial, plea, and sentencing. Now, this is one of the most interesting cases in the fact that this happened many, many years ago. And as I think every case, excluding Eric Smith, the murderer is still incarcerated or has passed away while incarcerated. Now, the girls, the one of the ways they ended up getting caught is because each of the girls went and told the story of what happened. A 15-year-old boy told that he had overheard a conversation pertaining to the murder when he was at a bowling alley. He heard Lawrence telling others that she had witnessed a murder and the police were talking to the 15-year-old boy that had overheard that statement. Melinda Lovelace and Mary Laurie Tackett were arrested on January 13th, 1992. They were initially only charged with murder. Additionally, charges were added, additional charges were added later on. And the, ch the new charges were child molesting, arson, criminal deviant conduct, battery with a deadly weapon, aggravated battery, criminal confinement, and intimidation. Melinda Lovelace had her trial set for June 23rd, 93. And uh, they all pleaded guilty to murder, arson, and criminal confinement. Now, they were all sentenced to over serve over 60 years with a... Um, able to be uh, up for parole after 25 years. Now, what's very interesting is that all four offenders have been released from prison. Tony Lawrence, 
was released from prison in the year 2000. Hope Rippey was released from prison in 2006. Laurie Tackett was released January 11th, 2018. And Melinda Loveless was released in 2019. Even though these events surrounding Shanda's murder occurred decades ago, the memory of her life and the brutality of her death continue to impact society. Thirty-some years later, Chandra's memory lives on. It is very unfair that her killers and murderers roam free. A 12-year-old girl's life was viciously taken. And it's a haunting reminder of the darkness that can lurk with the hearts of some individuals and their profound consequences of the cruelty of this world. It is a sad reminder of what the human being is able and capable of doing. And... Even to this day, it's impacting society and the judicial system. Thank you for joining tonight for another episode of The Dark Place. If you have any thoughts or questions about the episode or suggestions for the future, please reach out on social media and through the website, which is pretty much through social media. Remember to subscribe, rate, Join, friend, comment, and suggest. Until next time, take care and remember, be kind to one another. Have a good night.